Microservices seem to be what we in the UK call Marmite. Marmite is a strongly flavoured spread that's mostly eaten with toast. That's almost defined by the fact that people either love it or hate it. There is no middle ground. Some people seem to think that microservice is the only way to organise systems that they build. And others think that microservices are a huge mistake that's overtaken the industry and never really work. I think that both groups are probably wrong. The trouble is that in software development, though, there are always trade-offs. So what are the pros and cons of microservices? And how do we manage the technical debt that really underpins them? That's our topic for today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I recently watched a, an interesting discussion on the Neat Code IO YouTube channel, talking about microservices with guest Matt Ranney from DoorDash. Their conversation included lots of interesting and I thought insightful points. But I thought that the title Microservices are Technical Debt was kind of interesting, but sort of also wrong and right at the same time. So I'd like to explore this idea in a bit more detail. At first, it may seem like a crazy idea that an architectural approach embodies technical debt at its core. But I think that this is a reasonably fair description. As Matt, correctly in my view, points out, microservices are really a socio-technical strategy more than a technical one, and one that's often deeply misunderstood. What this really means is that their real value is as a technical solution to a social problem. Or is that as a social solution to a technical problem? Fundamentally, microservices are more about team organization and dynamics than they are about software architecture and design. But then again, we can probably say that about most design choices. We have learned that software at any scale is best built by small teams because without that, the cost of communication between the teams overwhelms any productivity gains that we get by adding more people to the development process. Actually, we've known this for a very long time, since at least 1970, when Fred Brooks talked about it. But we regularly seem to forget it anyway. The excellent book, Team Topologies, recommends a maximum team size of only eight people. And the other excellent book, Accelerate, says that one of the main predictors, the defining characteristics of excellence in software development, is the autonomy of those teams. So if we need small autonomous teams, what's the impact of that on our design choices? Fundamentally, we need to manage the complexity of the systems that we build so that each team is able to focus on their own work unfettered as far as we can manage it by the work of other teams. This is a lot easier said than done, but this is the core, the heart of microservices as a strategy. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic, Tuple, Honeycomb and UltraEdit. Equal Experts is a multinational consultancy built on applying the ideas and techniques that we talk about here to build great software for their clients. Transfic is a financial technology company applying advanced continuous delivery techniques to deliver low latency trade routing services to some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. Tuple builds software to make pair programming easier for people who work remotely and Honeycomb help engineering teams deeply understand their own production systems through observability. UltraEdit is a powerful configurable text editor capable of hex and text code editing, which boasts unrivaled performance for handling large files. All of these companies offer products and services that are very well aligned with the topics that we discuss here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, Click on the links in the description below and do check them out. In general terms, I talk about the importance of managing complexity through the use of modularity, cohesion, separation of concerns, abstraction and managed coupling. One take on all of this, but not the only one, is microservices. 
We compartmentalize our systems into coherent, sensibly bounded parts with clearly defined interfaces between those parts so that we can make a change in one part of the system without forcing change on any other part. This, and only this really, is what microservices are really there for. There are other advantages, but all of those other advantages are available by other means, often without the trade-offs that microservices imply. For example, many people talk about how microservices make systems more scalable. But you can write very scalable systems that aren't based on microservices, and the way in which microservices help with scalability is usually more about effective data sharding than it is about microservices. So what are these trade-offs when it comes to microservices? And where's the technical debt? Well, the main trade-off is between the autonomy with which we can develop something and the design complexity that we need to buy into to achieve that autonomy. I've talked about that in other videos. If microservices are to be of any help achieving any increase in autonomy, we need well-defined interfaces between services so that we can make change in one part of the system without forcing change on another. That means taking lots more care about the design at these points where the communication between the pieces takes place. If we don't take that extra care, then we're making a very big mistake because we're giving away the independence of deployment that leads to autonomy and yet still paying the cost of having made that choice. And this time while paying a higher cost in terms of the friction in the development process. If I have a microservice that is dependent on yours and we can only release our services together after some form of testing, then what have we really got? We have a distributed monolith. And this is a very costly way to implement a distributed monolith because mistakes are more distributed and feedback is slower. Now, if you need my service to change to work with changes that you'd like to make to yours, you've either got to ask me to do the work with all of the problems of scheduling, including the differences between our relative priorities for this new feature. You may care a lot and I can't be bothered. So you need this yesterday and I will grudgingly add it to my schedule for next year. Or you could change it yourself. So now you need access to my repository, use of my deployment pipeline, and you need to be familiar enough with my code base to change it safely. And I need to trust you to do it. This second approach is actually a pretty good strategy, but using separate repositories just adds more complexity and more overhead and extra barriers to this working well. A much easier strategy for dealing with coupled code like this is to adopt a shared code ownership in a single repository and use continuous integration and continuous delivery to evaluate all of the changes together whenever they happen. If you'd like to learn more about better ways of working like this, now's a great time to try one of my courses because this week we have a 25% Black Friday sale on for any course on our training site. We also have a limited number of 50% off coupons remaining and there are only 100 and they're running out fast. So do check out the link in the description below to see if you can get one of those. If we keep everything in one repository, evaluate every change together in one deployment pipeline, we're more accurately facing the reality of the situation that these so-called microservices aren't really microservices at all. They're really just simply components of something bigger that we're unable to determine whether it works or not without testing it all together before we release. That's a monolith. So the sense in which microservices represent technical debt is that we implement more complex code that is less computationally efficient and that works in ways that are less organizationally efficient unless these things are truly independently deployable. As the definition for microservices says they should be. The problem here is once again one of semantic diffusion. The meaning of the term microservice has been devalued, watered down over time, seemingly now to mean a small lump of code that communicates via XML over HTTP. The idea was much more than that, as I discussed with the inventor of microservices, James Lewis, quite recently. Here's the usual working definition. And nearly all of these characteristics are primarily there as mechanisms to deliver autonomy for the teams that produce them by making the services independently deployable. 
notice that despite the common assumptions, there's nothing here that says that microservices must or should communicate via XML over HTTP. You can have microservices that don't do either, and you can have code that isn't a microservice that does both. So we don't gain in autonomy. We pay a fairly significant price for it and get no benefits that we couldn't also get without paying that price. That certainly seems to qualify as technical debt to me. Even when we can independently deploy our microservices with no coordination with other teams or groups, then we are still incurring a technical debt of a kind, but now it's a better kind of debt in that we are getting something useful for it. We pay extra, but we gain in autonomy. We pay with more sophisticated design thinking and in terms of significantly more effort and coordination costs when we need to change multiple services or debug our now considerably more complex systems. I know that I sound like a microservice skeptic when I talk about stuff like this, but I'm not. I'm a big believer that this is the most scalable way to build large complex systems and that we should be spending the time to think more carefully and come up with better designs anyway. But all this requires a level of design sophistication that isn't always evident. Or to put it another way, as Martin Fowler describes it in his 2014 article on the topic, you need to be this tall to take the microservices ride. An important part of this design sophistication necessary to make microservices an effective choice is deciding where to draw sensible boundaries between our services. Dividing things up into smaller, more independent pieces is a very good idea, but not a new one. And it's not easy. And it's not only possible with microservices. It's really what software design is all about. Past assumptions that dealing with the scalability problem also fell at this hurdle. Corba and DCOM were distributed component architectures that were designed to solve exactly the same problem as microservices a generation before. And they failed because people didn't think enough about what was actually happening when you called a remote service. I recall seeing two Corba services. One executed a loop which called the other service across the network to process data a byte at a time. This is at least a thousand times slower than running this loop in process because each byte would now be sent on its own across the network and take at least one kilobyte in the form of a network packet. This is just one of the problems that Matt Ranney talks about in his interview that I mentioned earlier. People building microservices but not thinking about the implications of communicating over a network. There are significant costs to communicating over networks, not just in terms of speed, though that's certainly one consideration, but also in terms of the way that distributed communications can go wrong. It's a much more complicated thing. What happens to you, your microservice system when the service that your service calls isn't there? Or is working so slowly that you don't get a response in the time that you expected? So when designing distributed systems like this, any distributed system, microservices or not, you must be mindful of the conversations that are happening and the ways in which they can go wrong. Matt said that the average fan out from a request to their system at DoorDash resulted in over a thousand messages from services. One message resulted in a thousand interactions. This is quite a scary thought not just in terms of performance of the system, but also the complexity of diagnosing problems if something should go wrong. The advantage and one of the costs of microservices is that the logic inside the service boundaries kind of becomes less important and the communication between the services more important. So we need to design the communications between our services with much greater care. These points in the design of our system matter a lot. They give us big wins if we get them right. But more often, because of the difficulty of getting them right, they come at a huge cost. Thank you very much for watching. And if you enjoy our stuff here on the Continuous Delivery channel, please do consider supporting our work by joining our Patreon community. And to our existing Patreon members, I'd like to say a big thank you for your support.